Hello, Brave World. This is the Artaria String Quartet. Hope everybody's doing well. Welcome, colleagues. Long time no see, right? Um, we are delighted to bring to you our January edition of the virtual concerts of Artaria String Quartet. And we have a, an interesting program tonight. Um, three very diverse pieces, which my colleagues and, uh, and also one living composer are going to talk about in just a minute here. Um, Hello, Brave World. This is the Artaria String Quartet. Hope everybody's uh -oh. doing good. Welcome, Nancy, colleagues. Nancy, Long you'll have to turn right. something off there, or somebody's got another broadcast yeah. going. Okay, so um, Nancy, you had some things you wanted to mention uh, about uh, the where we are about this concert. I wanted to turn it over to you. Yes. Uh, well, I did, of course. Welcome, everybody, and I'm glad you're here. And we all certainly are glad you're here. So I, I had a very brief message and just letting you know that tonight's concert, 20% uh, of the proceeds from your donations tonight are being um, offered to the National Urban League. And they do such wonderful work. And on behalf of persons of, of color and um, a black population and to support people uh, in their on their journeys so just letting you know that we are we are in support of that this month so thanks for being here absolutely um the concert i wanted to mention the, the concert tonight excuse me concert next month will be um on i believe it's the 19th of february let's make sure i got that correct yes february 19th just want to give people a heads up about that so they can mark their calendars we just decided it this week and uh, we'll be planning our, our concerts monthly as we go forward and uh, bringing you a lot of repertoire chamber music wise so the first person i would like to uh, introduce right now is patty ryan and she's going to talk to us about uh, mr green's string quartet so hey, patty you're up hi uh yeah so you know, it, it was kind of funny how this all came about, but through the interweb of being a musician and knowing a bunch of, uh, you know, chamber music nerds and everything, I was talking to one of my old friends, Francesca McNeely, who was mentioning her participation in this organization called Castle of Our Skins, which is a Boston-based organization that has been for many years trying to bring to light uh, people of color's music. And of course, now there's a bigger spotlight on what they're doing. And I, uh, through Francesca, uh, met Anthony Green, who uh, but then, you know, in looking at his repertoire, I saw that he had a string quartet and thought, hmm, I should check it out. And when I did, I liked the piece and, of course, spoke with him about it. And he's such a lovely, lovely person, as you'll see in a moment. He's going to speak a little bit about his inspiration behind the piece. Uh, personally, but uh, I just want to say how much it, it's been a pleasure to get to know him and call him a new friend. And I hope that, you know, we'll have some kind of collaboration in the future. Um, but without further ado, here is, in his words, his inspiration be behind the piece, Chance. Chance String Quartet has a really, really special place in my heart for, for many reasons. I grew up as a pianist primarily, and I thought I was going to be a pianist my whole life. But when I switched over to study composition at Boston University at the suggestion of one of my classmates, I remember starting that first year officially my sophomore year studying with Dr. Martin Amlin at Boston University. And Dr. Amlin, in his very benevolent way, prodded me to really start to study the craft of composition and incorporate much more involved melodies, a finer attention to structure and texture and detail. And his way of telling me this really lit a fire within me. Also up until that time, I was super afraid to compose for strings. And Dr. Amlin had mentioned something about the genius of Bernard Herrmann, especially with regards to the music that he composed for Psycho. And somehow this light bulb went off in my head and I started to compose this string quartet, 
which eventually turned out to be the last movement of a four movement, 35 minute long string quartet. And I called this movement Chants, C-H-A-N-T-S, because I was thinking about pagan rituals combined with the psycho music, combined with all sorts of other imagery and musical devices that I had put into this string quartet. The original chants with NTS at the end also has this massive fugue. And I had tried unsuccessfully to get this piece performed during my undergraduate at Boston University. Fast forward to my master's when I started studying with Lee Hyla at New England Conservatory, and it came time for the composition professors to suggest pieces for the honors ensembles at New England Conservatory to perform. Lee Hyla saw my string quartet chants and said, if you edit this piece, I think it would be a perfect fit for the string quartet honors ensemble to play during a concert at Jordan Hall. And I said, great. So I edited the string quartet movement. I took out the fugue at the end and I made some minor adjustments to the musical material at the beginning and submitted it and it was accepted. And the string quartet who performed it, who premiered it, the Laurel String Quartet, their recording was so fantastic. It was really one of the first times that I got this extremely stellar, extremely professional recording of one of my pieces. And that recording has been such a wonderful part of my life because it has led to many other opportunities. And I can almost safely say that Chance, C-H-A-N-C-E, which I retitled after I edited the piece, I can safely say that this string quartet is my most performed piece. And I'm grateful for every ensemble who has played it. And I'm extremely grateful for uh, the performance that you're about to hear as well. So thank you so, so very much. And I hope you enjoy the backstory as well as the music to Chance, C-H-A-N-C-E, for String Quartet. Chance, String
I love that piece more and more each time I hear it. What a what a pleasure it was for us to share that. Uh, it's fascinating to always contemplate uh, what inspires composers to write. And this next quartet by Mozart that we're about to share with you is one of a set of six that he wrote in uh, dedication to Haydn. And um, he had met Haydn in 1781, and um, after hearing his Haydn's Opus 33 quartets, he uh, really began this labor of love of these six quartets to present to Haydn. Uh, so this quartet was written in the summer of 1783, and what's interesting is that uh, the manuscript contains more corrections and erasures and changes than any other of his manuscripts. Um, and it was premiered in 1785, 
And uh, Haydn, upon hearing the quartets, he said to Mozart's father, before God and as an honest man, I tell you that your son is the greatest composer known to me, either in person or by name. He has taste and what is more, the most profound knowledge of composition. So very touching uh, what, he, what he shared with Mozart's father. And what I want to read to you what Mozart wrote as he presented the complete set of quartets um, to Haydn, uh, deeply, deeply touching words. He said, to my dear friend Haydn, a father who had resolved to send his children out into the great world took it to be his duty to confide, confide them to the protection and guidance of a very celebrated man, especially when the latter by good fortune was at the same time his best friend. Here they are then. O oh, great man and dearest friend, these six children of mine, they are, it is true, the fruit of a long and laborious endeavor. Yet the hope inspired in me by several friends that it may be at least partly compensated encourages me. And I flatter myself that this offspring offspring will serve to afford me solace one day you yourself dearest friend told me of your satisfaction with them during your last visit to this capital it is this indulgence above all which urges me to commend them to you and encourage me to hope that they will not seem to you altogether unworthy of your favor may it therefore please you to receive them kindly and to be their father guide and friend from this moment i resign to you all my rights in them begging you, however, to look indulgently upon the defects which the partiality of a father's eye may have concealed from me, and in spite of them, to continue in your generous, generous friendship for him who so greatly values it, in expectation of which I am, with all my heart, my dearest friend, your, your most sincere friend, W.A. Mozart. So very touching, the deep respect and admiration that they shared with each other. Uh, what's unique about this quartet is that it's highly chromatic. In the first 10 uh, notes of the piece, you hear nine of the 12 notes of the chromatic scale. So that chromaticism you'll hear throughout the quartet. Um, the second movement is interesting in that there, in addition to this grinding, uh, you have the grinding harmon uh, harmonies, you'll notice that you don't hear an obvious tune. Uh, the, the third movement, Minuet and Trio, probably sounds the most uh, like a tribute to Haydn and kind of reminiscent of Haydn, but it's got some of Haydn's humor as well, almost kind of like a, a, a bray of a donkey happening in the first violin part. Uh, and the last movement is quite playful.
Thank you. 
Oh, that's a wonderful quartet. <laughs> oh, gosh. You know, that one, uh, that Mozart is not known as the chromatic uh, quartet. Opus uh, or K-464 gets that honor of uh, its chromaticism, but this one surely was prescient of what was to come in later quartets by Mozart. You know, we're going to turn now to Janacek. And I have a little bit of some interesting background about him, I think, that as I was uh, digging into Janacek a little bit this week, um, you know, noting for the first time that he was from Czechoslovakia, and which what is now Czechoslovakia, the Republic, and but he was from the Moravian district. And that was right next door to the Bohemian district. And they were just a couple hours, you know, I mean, they were, they, they were neighbors. Um, and I thought, well, that's interesting because I wonder where my grandfather's family was from. And it turns out that they were from Southern Bohemia from a little village, just a couple hours away from Janicek, who was over in Moravia in a little village called Huckbaldi. Um, and I thought that was interesting. My goodness. Well, I wonder, you know, who, we know other uh, 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 Bohemian or Czech composers. I wonder where Smetna was from. Well, Smetna was from Eastern Bohemia. And I looked up the distance and all that, less than a couple of hours away from my great, great grandparents. And then I looked up Dvorak, of course, Dvorak. Well, he was just two hours north of where my family was living in central Bohemia. Well, I thought I'd keep going. Where was Mahler from? I always thought Mahler was from Austria. No, Mahler was from Bohemia, just a couple hours from where my family was living. <laughs> um, and then I thought, well, I'm just gonna keep going one more generation here. Erwin Schulhoff is also, he, he was from Prague in central Bohemia. And they were just an hour north. Prague was just an hour north from my family. <laughs> so I just had, you know, there's just so much, um, so many wonderful composers and such a lineage there. And uh, all of them trace themselves, except for um, Schulhoff, from small villages. But there was lots of music going on and lots of folk music. Well, Janacek led the way in the 1890s for uh, uh, folklore, uh, folk music, and he uh, used that throughout his uh, life in his music, and certainly you're going to hear the Moravian influence in this quartet number one tonight named the um, Kreutzer Sonata. Um, you can throw out all ideas of what form it should be because he did and uh it he just abandoned traditional harmony and homophony and counterpoint and he used a principle that he called thematic montage creating a picture for you and a story for you and i had something i was thinking about uh talking to you about but then during the week one of our wonderful concert goers and who is probably here tonight listening warren Warren Jacobson sent an email over to Ray and I, and uh, I thought, you know, I'm gonna, I would love to share, Warren, if it's okay with you, I'm going to share what you wrote to us in your email. So this is from Warren. Not being even slightly familiar with Janicek's Kreutzer Sonata, my first thought was, hmm, what an unusual name for a string quartet. I quickly learned that it was named after a novella by none other than Leo Tolstoy. And it, in turn, was named after a sonata for violin and piano by the great master himself, Ludwig von Beethoven. Having never read any Tolstoy, Warren, whatsoever thus far in my life, I felt very much obligated to read the Kreutzer Sonata. I was immediately reminded of what it is I truly enjoy about 19th century fiction. It's slow. It's luxurious. Extravagant. It takes delight in careful descriptions of people and surroundings. Any and all abstract ideas when presented are thoroughly examined in excruciating detail. 19th century fiction isn't so much about moving the story along, it's more about setting a mood and flushing out the personalities of the characters. Tolstoy, oops, sorry, does an exemplary job of doing that. 
So here is Warren's summary, which I'm going to summarize Warren's summary. The story takes place on a train. We're introduced to a passenger named Pojnishev, who philosophizes extensively about the fallacy of love, the societal expectations of marriage, our instinctive biological impulses, and so forth. He makes no secret that he murdered his wife due to infidelity. Although he was acquitted by the court and is a free man, it's quite clear that he's suffering from a great deal of inner torment and anguish. At age 30, he had met and fallen in love with the woman who would soon become his wife. He describes a miserable life as a, as a married man, constant squabbles and arguments with his wife, punctuated by brief but passionate reconciliations. They soon have children and he discovers that much of her attention is focused on them, not him. In her 30s, she begins to devote her time to other pursuits, and foremost is the piano, and she becomes quite good at it. So at the urging of her husband, a handsome young professional violinist uh, be begins playing music with her, and Podnozhev becomes increasingly jealous of their cozy musical relationship. An informal concert is organized, and the two perform Beethoven's Kreutzer Sonata together to a gathering of friends and acquaintances. Podznyshev is called away on business soon after that, and he receives a letter from his wife and suspects she's spending time with the violinist. He immediately starts heading for home, which takes some time and involves train rides, multiple horse-drawn carriages at full gallop. And he finally arrives at home late at night and discovers the two together drinking tea. He surprises them while brandishing a dagger. The violinist flees and Podznyshev impales the dagger into his wife's body, resulting in several hours of misery and eventually death. Now, this offers Janacek a fine example for writing a piece of program music. It captures the rumble of the train. It captures the arguments and the reconciliations. It captures the gallop of the horses as he makes his way home. It even quotes Beethoven's original Kreutzer Sonata. But more than anything else, it captures the overall mood that Tolstoy establishes so well. The torment, the turmoil, the anguish, it's all in there. It's a masterful piece of music. And Warren says, I'm excited to hear Artaria bring it to life. Thank you, and I hope you all enjoy.
Everybody here? Good. Well, I apparently, uh, well, what a moving piece. You want to sing those lines at the end. And uh, uh, apparently uh, Janacek did read the novella quite well and created a dramatic, a dramatic uh, scene and, and uh, ca or captured it in the medium of music. It's a beautiful piece to listen to, um, terrifying, gorgeous, and it's equally uh, terrifying and gorgeous to play too. Um, Artaria has played it several times over the last uh, three decades, and each time more information or more new ideas or more feelings or whatever you want to call it flows over me every time I play my notes. And I'm sure my colleagues are the same way when, they, when they're doing that. So, so any, any parting words here? We, we appreciate our audience and, uh, every, and the listeners and, of course, the support of uh, Bob and Diane Moore. Each, each month they have been supporting our concerts and we thank them from the bottom of our heart to keep our Atari going and um, uh, keep chugging along. We have uh, some new projects that are coming up um, as we go. We'll tell you about them um, as they come, as they appear. And, and we keep working on developing audiences and our repertoire and, and uh, continuing to play chamber music because we love it quite a, quite a bit. So. Any words from my colleagues here, or should we say good night? And join us in the Zoom room. I'm not saying good night to anybody. You got to talk. <laughs> Bring okay. your beverage. Bring your beverage and come and talk. Come and chat. All right. Well, we're getting that Zoom room started here. We will. Uh, we will. We'll bid you all a a momentary goodbye until we switch <laughs> over. Thank you all. Good to see you. Take care. Thanks.